This is our fifth message. There's only been one more after today. We're releasing right now our middle school students with Paul and Teresa. They're going to teach this same lesson to them. I want you to look around just a minute while we get settled in. This is a wonderful group out here this morning. Come on, give your hands yourselves a round of applause. So good to see all of you. Thank you so much for coming out to Family First. Give a great big shout out to our Facebook, our live stream church. Everybody turn around and look at the camera and wave. Can you do that? Just tell hello to them. We love you. We're so thankful. This morning at the early service, the 8.30 service was a wonderful time. I think we had the biggest crowd at 8.30 this morning that we've had maybe in a long, long time. I'm so excited about that. And uh, I'm excited about the message today as we continue to learn about kingdom citizenship. Uh, we've been teaching some new things. We've been talking about some things that you don't normally hear. This is like a, a vision casting series. New ideas, new paradigms, some new uh, dreams and goals. Our philosophy into the year 2020 and beyond. We're not going back to religion, folks. We're still in the kingdom. We're never going back to to, to church. We're never going back to religion. We're advancing the kingdom. If you understand that, put your hands together and say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It's a kingdom ministry. Our master text for the series is Philippians 3.20, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me recap for you what we've learned so far. If you've missed anything, this will bring you right up to speed. Three statements. Number one, we have a king. His name is Jesus. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He is the King. Our King, Jesus, has a domain. He has a kingdom. That's the realm, the rule, and the reign of His authority, His kingdom. Thirdly, we are citizens of that heavenly kingdom. I know we're in the earthly colony, but we're already, already in the heavenly kingdom because the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God would be interchangeable terms. You say, well, which is it? Is it the kingdom of heaven or is it the kingdom of God? And the answer is yes. It's of God because it's from God and it's all about God, but it's the kingdom of heaven because it's heavenly in its design. And it's very difficult for us sometimes to understand the nature of the kingdom because we don't live in a government that is a kingdom system. We live in a democratic system. So we look at the democracy in America and we kind of get confused, say, well, why doesn't the kingdom of God operate like the laws of government do in the United States? It's because the United States is a democracy, but the kingdom of God is a theocracy. It's a monarchy where God, the only wise, true God, our Savior, sits on the throne and rules and reigns in a power and authority. Can you say amen? And his government then, his kingdom, listen to this statement, it's a definition, it's an influence of a king over a territory. And he's impacting the territory with his will, his purpose, and his intent. And he's producing a culture and a moral standard for the citizens. That's why citizenship in the kingdom is very different than membership or the idea of being in some other organization. We've pointed this out from time to time throughout this series. Citizenship is different than membership. We're not just members of a religious group. We're not members of a church. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We're not just members because members have certain accommodations. They have certain privileges. But we are citizens. And citizens have legal rights and prerogatives. I wasn't going to say this and I'll have to watch my time here this morning. But once you are granted citizenship, I think this is true. I'm not going to preach it as I know for sure because I'd really have to research it. But it's my understanding that once you're granted citizenship it can never be taken away from you I mean a lot of things could be taken away from you. your freedoms could be taken away from you you could actually rebel and you can be incarcerated in a worse form of offense of course you could commit treason and you could actually lose your life but even then you would never lose your citizenship because citizenship is a legal standing. How many are glad we're legal citizens of the kingdom of heaven this morning? Can you say amen? So last week our focus was this, on the benefits of kingdom citizenship, which is based on uniqueness. Because the benefits of citizenship in a country with a kingdom system of government can far outweigh the benefits of citizenship in even wealthy nations on the earth that do not have a kingdom form of of government. There are tremendously wealthy nations on the earth. Tremendously wealthy leadership and hierarchy in some of these nations, but the people do not benefit because they are not kingdom based systems. They are communistic or other forms of government. 
So here's my takeaway from last time. If you were here last week, this is the takeaway. And I think for the whole series, a citizen's number one asset is what? Do you remember last week? Oh, that's awesome. You guys make me feel good. A citizen's number one asset is his, I think you probably just saw it off the screen. <laughs> a citizen's number one asset is knowledge. Knowledge of all the things that the king has for you, all the things the king is willing to provide for you, everything he wants you to have. Oftentimes people don't have everything the king wants them to have because they don't know he wants them to have it. Here's Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. They don't know what's on the ticket of everything that God has given them. So let me give you a couple of verses. I love these. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing. Everybody say no good thing. No good thing will he withhold from those whose walk is upright. 1 Timothy 6, 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who gives richly all all things to enjoy. Here is Psalm 23. And if you notice on the screen, the little initials behind Psalm 23, this is the TRC version. It's not the ESV or the NIV or the New Enver. This is the TRC version. This is my own interpretation. It's a literal translation. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not lack for any good thing. So today we're going to turn the corner on the citizenship series. Everybody doing okay with me so far? How many are in love with the pastor? Can I see your hand? How many receivers? How many are, are excited about what I'm gonna teach you today? This is gonna be a little bit of a love test now because we're gonna shift from not only all the blessings and all the benefits and all the good things, but we're gonna talk about some responsibilities. We're gonna talk about some duties. We're gonna talk about some obligations, some duties of kingdom citizenship. And I want you to remember that your citizenship does not only mean that the government is responsible for taking care of you. This is not a political statement. I'm not talking about the United States. I'm talking about the kingdom of God. But it also means that you are responsible to the kingdom. You have some obligations. You have some duties. It's not about everything God's going to do for you. It's how you're going to serve God. It's not how you can just benefit personally from all the resources. And I'm going to tell you right now, I'm celebrating all the blessings, all the benefits, all the rewards. I'm a king's kid. I'm walking with God. I'm too stressed, too blessed to be stressed. I mean, greater is he that's I I'm going to go on and on. But those are wonderful. But those do not take away the fact that I have some obligations and some duties in the kingdom. It's a two-way street. Are you with me? The traffic travels in both directions. And just in an earthly country, it's true in the heavenly kingdom that I am held accountable to the government according to the constitution. What is the constitution of the kingdom? It's the word of God. So the word of God not only lists all the benefits, all the rewards, all the prerogatives of citizenship, it also lists the duties and the responsibilities because a system of government I'm not talking about naturally although this is true a system of government with only blessings and no responsibilities is what it's a fantasy I'm telling you what right now it ain't gonna happen there will never be a culture there will never be an environment there will never be a government there will never be a system on this earth or even in the world to come that has all benefits and all blessings and all 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 great things and no responsibilities that that's a fantasy land i told the early service now that's a little bit older crowd you know those people are the people that remember the 80s i don't know if any of you remember the 80s or not some of you are a lot younger but in the 80s we had this television sit, uh, not a sitcom but an evening saturday night program it was called fantasy island how many remember that and ricardo montalban would land the plane on the little tarmac of this beautiful caribbean beach and the people would get off the plane and they would be looking around like this and he would say welcome 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 to fantasy island and then his little buddy the little short guy remember him tattoo that he would say welcome welcome to fantasy island if you think this is fantasy island and all you're going to get as benefits and blessings and rewards and great things and never have any duties or obligations you're in a fantasy land for sure the kingdom of God the government of his kingdom gives us some duties so I'm going to talk to you today about some duties I'm going to talk to you about the fact that in the kingdom of God in the family of God everybody does chores 
In your family, does everybody do chores? I hope they do. They won't appreciate what they've got if they don't earn it. Well, I'm preaching a lot better than you're shouting here right now this morning. But in the kingdom of God, there are some duties. Let me give them to you. Here's number one. Write it down. It's in the fill in the blanks on the program. We put some notes on the YouVersion app. Look on the screen. The duties of kingdom citizenship is to number one, to submit to the authority of the king. That's your number one responsibility. Submit to the authority of the king. That makes it pretty simple. When you become a citizen of a country, the laws of that country become your laws. Now, if people have immigrated from other countries and they come into the United States, we had people in the early service that were not born Americans. They migrated into America and they obtained American citizenship. They will tell you that you have to go to classes. You have to learn. You have to study. You have to know what the laws of this country are. And when you sign up for citizenship, you are saying, I adopt that the laws of this country are my country. It's like in the book of Ruth where it says, I will go where you will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And when you submit to the laws of that government, you're submitting to the authority of that government. And the submission brings great freedoms. Now I'm getting ready to preach it up here this morning. I hope you're not going to go to sleep on me. Submission to authority releases great freedoms in your life. You have freedom to remain in the country as long as you want. You have freedom to move around freely and travel freely. You have freedom to enjoy the protections and the blessings and the privileges of citizenship. You have freedom to obey the laws of the land. You have freedom to do what's right. You have freedom to contribute. You have freedom to participate. But you don't have freedom to disobey. Come on, get a hold of this. You have freedom to submit, but you don't have freedom to rebel or reject. Because if you just break one law, you don't have to break eight laws to go to jail. I hope you know that. You don't have to break ten laws. It's not three strikes you're in. You just break one law. And one law, and you can suffer the consequences for breaking that law. Now, this is interesting to me. Now, I'm going to get down here, and it'll get me off my, my uh, script a little bit and kind of get a little bit more extemporaneous, and that's a little dangerous, but I got my wife in the front row, and she's praying in the Holy Spirit 24 hours a day for me. It's a big job, but somebody's got to do it. And uh, if in the garden, when God put his people in the garden, which Pastor Omar taught, was that Wednesday night? That that's the origin of the kingdom. If you want to know where the kingdom started, it's when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, and he gave them complete dominion over everything. That was the start of the kingdom. There was only one rule, not 10 rules. Not 613 rules. There's only one. Religion took one rule. What was the one rule? Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Religion took one rule and multiplied it into ten commandments. Judaism took the ten commandments and multiplied it into the 613 laws of the Mishnah. I don't know if you realize this, but the Mishnah, which is the Jewish interpretations of the Talmud, their, their doctrines, they can list. In fact, I looked on Google, and there's a website that lists all 613. I just scrolled through them, just looking through them. 613 individual laws to try to summarize the 10 laws that we call the Ten Commandments, which could be summarized by the one law that do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So it is any wonder that Jesus said the number one commandment is love the Lord your God, with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. But man rejected that one commandment. And when he rejected that one commandment, of course, he came under the, the, uh, the, the disregard of the blessings of citizenship in that colony in the garden in the earth. So a couple of facts to help, you help me track with this. We are citizens with legal rights to benefit from the Constitution of the kingdom of God. But letter B, we have personal rights and authority, which is, I love the word authority, it's permission to use power. Listen to that. Permission to use power. Power without authorization is illegal. But if you have authority, you have permission to use power. And we exercise our power as a citizen through the alignment with the laws of the Constitution. And that last phrase is so critical, it's what so many people meet, miss. 
aligning with the laws of the Constitution. The secret to having great authority in your life, spiritually and in every other way, is submitting to authority. Because submitting to authority releases great authority in your life. Now, this is where so many people miss it. I'm not talking about you people. I'm talking about all those other people. You know, those people that aren't here today. But this is where so many people miss it. They see authority as overbearing. They see authority as mean-spirited. They see authority as limiting. They see authority as restricting. But what you've got to realize is that authority doesn't limit you, it releases you. It doesn't restrict you, it blesses you. It, it doesn't burden you down, it frees you up. Because when you walk under authority, you have permission to use that authority that is granted to you. And if you try to use authority without authorization of permission, it's illegal and you don't have the right to do what you think you want to do but when you're under the authority of God or of whatever entity is releasing you you're doing what you're doing because you're authorized by the legal right of the person that gave you that and you've got all rights and authority to use that power to do and accomplish what you want to do so here's a verse and I know some people are thinking I knew pastor was going to get to that Hebrews verse I just knew as soon as he said that a word this morning Authority. As soon as he said that A word this morning, he was going to quote Hebrews 13, 17. What's it say? So I'll quote it. Since you were expecting me to quote it, I wouldn't want to disappoint you. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls. I don't even comment on that. As those who will have to give an account, and I won't even comment on that. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, and I won't even comment on that. But look at the last phrase. For that would be of no advantage to you. Almost nobody pays attention to the last phrase. For that would be of no advantage to you. In other words, if you do not submit to the authorities that keep watch over your soul, that it will give an account and let them do it with joy, it will not be an advantage to you. If it's not an advantage to you, it will be a disadvantage to you. So what's it saying? The authority is there for your benefit, for your blessing, for your covering. Because when you come under the protection of the covering of the shadow of the Almighty, Psalm 91.1 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And when I'm under the shadow of the Almighty, when I'm under that environment, I'm under that covering of His authority, He's going to protect me. He's going to provide for me. He's going to be everything that I need Him to be. But I would get out of that environment I come under problems because I'm out from under the shadow of the Almighty the protection of the covering of the Lord are you with me so let me illustrate this I know this is a stretch but uh, just use your imagination how many are childlike I didn't say childish childlike you have a good imagination just a couple that's all that's okay I'll, I'll use it anyway the rest of you can grow into it Imagine the plant. Now there's a, there's, a, there's a test for you. Imagine the plant saying to the soil, I am so sick and tired of you dirt. I am so sick and tired of this pot. This pot has restricted me my whole life. I'm tired of being confined to this dirt. I'm plant tired of being planted in this soil. I'm tired of being potted. I'm going to bust out of this pot. I'm going to shake off the soil. And I'm just going to go out here in the open air. I'm just going to live my life free as I can be. What do you think would happen to that plant? That plant's going to die because it got out of the environment where it was designed to thrive and it got under, out from under the covering of it being where it was planted. Now get a hold of this, this is statement. This, this is powerful. The absence of authority brings self-destruction. That'll preach. The absence of authority releases self-destruction. If you didn't like the plant analogy, let's just go to the animal kingdom. Fish were created to thrive where? In the water. That's the environment that they were created for. And if the fish were to decide to move out of the water, 
I'm not staying in this tank anymore. I'm not liking this water. I just want to get up here on the beach. I, I just, I'm so tired of, of swimming. I'm so tired of, of being in this, in, in this atmosphere. I'm just going to go out here on, on the beach and, and I'm going to live in another, another environment. You wouldn't have to punish that fish to get it back in the water. It's going to get back in the water as quick as it can because it's going to realize it was created to thrive in that liquid environment and it cannot survive in the atmosphere of the air. Have you ever seen a fish out of water? I mean, it's not a pretty sight. Flips and flops and, and uh, gasps and, and heaves. I mean, it's, it's not a pretty sight. A fish out of water is not a pretty sight to behold. Now, here's the love test. I've seen a few people. Flip and flop <laughs> and gasp and heave like a fish out of water because they got out from under the place that God designed for them to thrive. They got into an environment they could not handle and they realized they bit off more than they could chew and they should gladly get back under the covering of the protection of being in the place where God wanted them to thrive. Now, how many are still here this morning? Can you say a good amen? Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. How many are doing okay with me so far? All right, here's the test. There's lots of tests here this morning. Here's the next one, the big one. I hear this all the time. Maybe not in these words, but I just see it. Well, pastor, I'm submitted to God. God is the ruler of my life. Where did I start with number one? The responsibilities of the citizen are to be submission to the authority of, oh, yes, I'm in authority to the king. I'm submission to the authority of the king. God is the ruler of my life. I listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The, uh, and I get really worried every time people say the Holy Spirit in that tone of voice, it's like a leftover voice from Halloween. I just listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I get, and then here's what normally follows that statement. I'm in submission to God. I just don't need anybody else to be under, to listen to, to obey, to follow. I don't need any man. I don't need any leader. I don't need any pastor. I don't need any mentor. I just listen directly to God. Well, here's the statement. All governments have agents of delegated as well as absolute authority. Now, let me just let that sit there for a minute. Say I'm out here on Spring Hill Drive, and I'm driving my automobile. I've got my F-150 geared up. It's going 70 miles an hour down Spring Hill Drive. Everybody know what the speed limit is out here? Spring. Man, I'm so glad you know that. I was beginning to wonder. It's only 45. Now, over to closer to 19, it's even less than that. But right here, it's 45 miles an hour. Say I've got my F-150, 5.4 liter Triton V8 Ford found our first on road day and uh, I'm, I'm running down, almost misquoted that, <laughs> corrected myself at mid-sentence uh, and I'm, I'm going down Spring Hill Drive. What are you laughing about, Joel? If you can't dodge it, ram it. But anyway, I, I'm going down Spring Hill Drive and uh, I'm doing 70 miles an hour. Now listen very carefully to my words. The deputy sheriff pulls me over and he says, you're doing 70 in a 45. And I said, yeah, what's it to you, buddy? He says, he says, you're breaking the law. I say, whose law? He says, you're breaking Sheriff Al Nienheis's law. I said, well, you ain't him. Go on, listen to me. Sheriff Al Nienheis ain't here right now. He's the sheriff of Hernando County. And he doesn't see me going 40, uh, 70 miles an hour down a 45 mile, mile an hour speed limit on Spring Hill Drive. So you just go mind your own business and I'll, I'll just keep doing what I want. If Sheriff Al Nehis wants to correct me, then he can show up. But I'm not answering to him. I mean, I'm not answering to you because I answer to him. What do you think would happen in that response? He would say, I have you know. I am not Sheriff Al Nehis, but I am deputy ties and authorize and authorize on every other eyes I can think of to give you this ticket and he'll write me this ticket because if I'm rebelling against the laws of Sheriff Al Enice and he, even if he's nowhere around and his deputy is there, his deputy is a legal authorized representative of that authority and he has the authority to put me in correction because he's deputized and authorized to do so. Are you with me? So in the kingdom, yeah, we can say, oh, I just submit totally, completely to God. Well, that's good. But how do you do that? 
You do that in a practical way by recognizing there are people that God puts in your life to help you be the person you want to be. Help you grow into your future. Because submission, and I'll flip this to a positive thought here, submission makes power legal. Say, I've got the right to go 50 mile, 70 miles an hour down Spring Hill Drive, and no, I don't have that right because I don't have that permission. But if I was a deputy sheriff, and if someone was going down Spring Hill Drive 70 miles an hour and I needed to go catch them and give them a ticket, then I would have permission to break the speed limit because I was duly authorized to do that. And people can't understand that. They do want all the power. They want all the ability. They want all the authority. But they're not willing to submit to the authority that grants them that authority. Man, I'm preaching a whole lot better than you guys shouting this morning, but that's okay. The Chiefs are going to win this morning. They're going to, they're going to kick the butts of those people on the left coast. It's, it's going to be awesome. Right is always better than left. Come on, somebody. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8 is one of the best pictures of delegated authority in the Bible. It's a centurion. Now, a centurion was what? A military uh, ruler that was over 100 soldiers. So he's not a novice. He's not just new on the job. He, he's seasoned. He's got 100 warriors under his command. And he came to Jesus and he said, Jesus, my servant is lying at home sick of a fever. And he said to Jesus, or Jesus said to him, Matthew 8, 7, I will come and heal him. And then verse number 8, the Sertarian replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Only say the word and my servant will be healed. Now look at verse 9. It's so critical. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to another one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does that. Why? Because authority makes power legal. He was saying to Jesus, your authority, you're the creator of heaven and earth. You're the Lord God over sickness and disease. And so I realize that you have ultimate authority, but you don't even have to come personally. You just speak the word and your legal spoken authority declares that my servant will be healed. But a lot of people in the body of Christ, not just in the church, but in any environment, in business, in school, in your Situations wherever you're at, a lot of people want authority. Authority to do this and authority to do that. But they'll never have the authority that they want because they're not willing to submit to the authority that can give them the permission to operate in the atmosphere that they want to operate in. Everybody understand that? Can I linger just a second? Normally, the people that want authority are the least likely candidate that you should give it to them. Now, I'm just talking right now. Is it okay? I'm just talking Super Bowl Sunday, and I'm going to be done by 6.30 this afternoon. I guarantee you that. But here's what happens in the church, and if I had this happen a million times, people have come in with the attitude, and they always have an agenda. I'm just sharing this. I'm just speaking out of my heart. I, I honestly believe that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I do my best teaching. I do my best leading kind of in an environment like this. So if I can say something to prevent some future problem, then it'll be well worth our minimum time of investment here this morning. You understand that? But people will often come and they have an agenda. They have a vision of something that's happened some other church or somewhere else and they want to see Family First become number two of their church where they used to come from and they say, well, how long does it take? And these red flags just go up all over the place. I mean, I mean my brain just, gets, just gets, starts boiling. And they say, well, how long do you have to be in membership here before you get to be in authority? And here's my response. Longer than that. <laughs> I had a lady one time pointing her finger at me. Well, just how do you go about getting into authority here in this church? And here is my response. Very slowly. <laughs> That's how you get in authority here. Because those that are wanting to get in positions of influence are most likely the least likely 
candidates that you really want to release that. I'm teaching a doctrine level here this morning. You understand this? This is, this is not, this is not kid stuff. This is not just Christianette stuff, sermonette stuff. This is something though that if we understand these principles will build for a future that God will do a kingdom work in this house that will last the tests of time and the challenges of the enemy. So let's go on to number two. Number two, obligations of citizenship. To seek the righteousness of the kingdom. Not just seek the kingdom, but seek the righteousness of the kingdom. Now, what is righteousness? And um, if you've not heard this definition, you might want to write it down or just put it in the back of your mind. Righteousness is a right standing relationship with God that leads into right living. I have a declared righteousness. I am declared righteous by the blood of Jesus. I don't care who you are, where you've been, what you've done, what sin you've committed. If you confess and repent of your sin by the authority of the shed blood of Jesus, you are declared righteous instantaneously, forever, right at that moment in the presence of God. If you've experienced that declaration of righteousness, say praise God, because my past is forgotten. It is reversed. It is erased from my life. It was imputed to me the righteousness of God. But then there is also applied righteousness. Applied righteousness is where because I am right with God, I want to live right with God. Because he has declared me righteous, I want to grow into the future that he has destined for me. And when I submit to God's authority, he shows me what to do next. And he helps me change my behavior into the person that I really want to be. Now, I don't drive 70 miles an hour on Spring Hill Drive. I hope you know that. I hope you know that was an illustration. I only drive 48 miles, no, 45 miles an hour on Spring Hill Drive. The reason I do that is not because I'm afraid that Sheriff Al Nienheis is going to give me a ticket. The reason I do that is because I want to be a part of a culture that maintains a safe environment, so that the people, myself and others, my family and your family, don't get killed when we get out here on the roadways. And I want people to be out here in our, citizen, in our community driving under control so it's a safe environment because I want us to be a people of safety and protection. I don't do it for fear that I'm going to get a ticket. I do it because I want to be a part of the righteousness of the city of Spring Hill. Are you with me? And so many people, they seek the king, but not his righteousness. And when you seek the righteousness, you're willing to become a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And it's costly, but you do it for the benefit of everyone else. But in the long run, who does that include? It includes you. So we do it for our best interests. And so... Thirdly, and I wanted to linger on this, but number three is so important today. Our third obligation is to, and I love the words here, chosen very, very carefully, to honor the heart of the king. Our third duty as kingdom citizens is to honor the heart of the king. Not to just honor the king, but to honor the heart of the king. What do I mean by that? Willingly recognize what the king wants and why he wants it and willingly honor his will and his purpose as if it is my very own. Not just do what the king wants me to do, not just obey the word of God, not just follow the constitution of the kingdom because I'm commanded to do so. And if I don't do it, I'm in fear of judgment, which the Bible says that is really true. But the reason I obey is because I have a heart that has been changed by the heart of my king. And I honor my king's heart. And now I willingly want to take his rules and his laws and his lifestyle and make it my very own. And I want to honor the heart of the king. If you'd go ahead and put up 1 Peter. This is a powerful verse. I found this this week. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 17. I'll preach this someday. Here's a four-point sermon. And if you want to get a sermon to preach, you want to give a Bible study, here's a four-pointer for you. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. 
Fear God and honor the king. I had somebody after service this morning said, Pastor Coach, I'm really having a hard time with that number four right now. I said, yeah, I understand. <laughs> Honoring the government's a little tough right now. But here's, here's a four-pointer. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. Now, that's powerful, but if you look at this in the message, it is so awesome. Now, I don't often use the message, if you heard me say, as a... Uh, Bible version to teach doctrinally from, but for applications and illustrations, it becomes very careful, and my voice is getting tired, so I'm going to switch to this. Make the master proud of you by being good citizens. That's what it means to honor the heart of the king. Make the master proud of you by being good citizens. Respect the authorities, whatever their level. They are good emissaries for keeping order. It is God's will that by doing good, you might cure the ignorance of the fools who think that you're a danger to society. <laughs> That's quite a phrase. But exercise your freedom by serving God, not by breaking the rules. Treat everyone you meet with dignity. Love your spiritual family, revere God, and respect the government. I like that first phrase. Honor the heart of the king. How do we do that? By making the master proud of us by being good Citizens. That's how we honor the heart of a king. And I could talk for days about the word honor. If you've been at Family First for any length of time, you've heard this word a hundred times or more. It's permeating all of our mission and vision and core value statements of our church. It's the word honor. And when you have an obsession for honor, like I have an obsession for honor, my mind thinks in honor. My lifestyle gravitates towards honor. And when you operate expecting to see honor, every time and everywhere you look, all you see is dishonor. All I see in the culture today is dishonor. All I see in, in our society today is dishonor, dishonoring God, dishonoring others, dishonoring uh, people, dishonoring uh, different people that are not the same as we are, different colors, different creeds, different nationalities. There's just, there's just the dishonor that has so permeated our culture. And when you look for honor, the dishonor drives you crazy. Am, am I the only one? Come on. Does some of you just get... I mean, overwhelmed sometimes with the excessive dishonor that's going on in our culture right now. And I've given past teaching to this, so I'll say this quickly. Honor's not really the same as respect. Some people say, well, honor and respect, they're all the same. You know, I, I'm just thinking honor right now. I'm, I'm just imagining uh, reverence right now. No, uh, act, uh, 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 respect can be an attitude, but honor is an action. It's the action derived from the attitude of respect. So in the citizenship culture, to put it in this context, to honor the king of the kingdom, I love this statement, means that we have discerned the purity of the heart of our king and we are willing to do whatever he desires for us to do. If you have any discernment at all, you'll discern that the heart of your king is pure. From the inside out. He will never ever do anything to hurt you. Abuse you. Your heavenly father is a perfect father. He's not like an earthly father. He's a faultless perfectly good heavenly father. He's the good good father. He sees you the way he wants you to be. In your future. And when you see his heart. Of purity. Then there is something inside of you. That willingly desires to do whatever. It is that he desires for you to do. And this word honor, I've taught on it many times. Dr. Mike Brown, our mentor here of our house, and other people have helped us understand that honor is the master key that opens any door of the kingdom. How many know we're given the keys of the kingdom? Whatsoever we bind on earth. I'll, I'm going to comment a minute. You, you preached on that, didn't you? Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be. It, literal translation, whatsoever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, before we're doing it down here, the only reason we can do it down here is because it's already been done up there. We have authority to bind and loose down here because it's already been bound and loose up there. We're just enforcing the authority of what God has already done by his own design. 
we have the keys of the kingdom. One of the keys of the kingdom is the key of honor. And the key of honor will open any door that you need to have opened in your life. In the early service, we prayed. I don't think we did it in this service. The Holy Spirit kind of led a little bit differently. But in the early service, we prayed in a general blanket statement because yesterday in our community, I don't know how many were aware, there was a, a senseless act of violence in a community not three miles from our church. And a husband or a father and son, I guess it was, had had a conflict and uh, there was violence, there was shooting, the sheriff's deputies were called and the one person actually lost his life and the father is in Tampa General Hospital or somewhere expected to survive, but senseless violence. We're asking God to open doors that we can see that kind of brokenness healed in Spring Hill. That we can see that kind of senseless violence arrested and, and pushed back. That we could see people that are bound by alcohol and addictions and all kinds of sin that they could be set free in the name of Jesus. But the only thing that's going to open those doors is that as we honor them, they will recognize and we meet felt needs in people's lives, they will recognize the church has something to offer to my situation. Oh, the church, that's just not that religious organization down there on Spring Hill Drive. Family First, that's just not those people that get together on Sunday morning and they have a, a wonderful little praise and worship service and then, then they go home and they forget everything that they've learned for the last hour and a half and they just do whatever they want to do. No! What will open their hearts is if we do something tangible that causes something to shift in the heavens that would be reflected down here on the earth. Are you with me? And there's something that we can do. And I've been praying about when to tell you about this and how to approach this. And actually just yesterday, Friday, the Holy Spirit dropped this in my heart. And he said, Sunday's the day. So here we're going to do this today. I don't know if you're aware, maybe not. But there is a way that people have worked together that have greatly benefited a lot of people in a lot of different communities. How many have seen on social media, I know one of the biggest ones I first heard about was in Michigan. It's happened in other parts of the world or a country where churches have raised money and paid off literally millions of dollars of people's medical debt. And the result of that is that after people see the church helping them out in something tangible, they say, wow. Maybe I ought to go to church and check out that message. Maybe I ought to listen to the teaching of a God that would encourage people to do something so tangible in my life. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but there, did you say 10 million? There's $10 million of medical debt in Hernando County. In other words, the people that are in debt, only medical, nothing else medical. $10 million of medical debt in Hernando County. And there's a movement of a number of churches. This is not just the ministerial association of which I'm a part of. Now, a lot of the churches are in the ministerial association, but it's not in an a, um, official sense. The several churches are partnering with each other to show the unity and the love of Christ to Hernando County. And the goal is to raise, by the end of February, through all the churches, $50,000. $50,000 would erase $5 million of debt. Of course, the way they do that is corporate bargaining. You come to the table with some of these creditors with great amount of cash, and they'll settle for 10 cents on the dollar of what is actually owed. And the people's debt could be eliminated exponentially. And here's what would happen. The week of Easter, these people would get a letter in the mail. We just want you to know that the churches or maybe this, the church of Hernando County, not Family First, not First Baptist, not Second Presbyterian, not this Pentecostal or Catholic or Unitarian or Presbyterian or Episcopal, but the church of Hernando County has sowed a seed as an encouragement to you and your family and has wiped out your medical debt. How many think maybe some of those people would show up. How many think some of those people might come to church on Easter Sunday? And I don't care if they come to this church or the next church. I want to get them into the kingdom. Yes, sir. I want to get them into the family of God. 
If God brings them here, we'll minister to them and we'll grow them up. If God sends them somewhere else, I'll release that pastor to the responsibility to minister to them and grow them up. Now, here's the good news. And I got this a few days ago. Pastor Omar tells me this may have been uh, increased by now. But when I received this note in the mail, we have already received over $30,000. So we're over halfway there. We're already over halfway there to the goal of $50,000. I want to do something, I've taught this many times, that is called a prophetic act today. If we had the $20,000 to reach that goal, that'd be great. If we sow $1,000, $2,000, $5,000, $500, it's not going to matter. I mean, it will, but spiritually, the point is we're going to be involved. And we're going to shift something in the heavens and cause God to look down and say, wow, I'm going to bless that. I'm going to put my hand on that. I'm going to put my favor on that. And the increase of God is going to come to his kingdom. Not, not this church or that church, but to his church, the kingdom. You understand this? You don't hear this everywhere. There is a movement that's growing in America. It's growing in Hernando County. I believe, and I'm not being arrogant, but I believe that Pastor Omar and myself, through us praying for other churches for the last three years, we've maybe had some small part into play into causing this agreement to come together and churches work together for the glory of God. I thank God for that. I take no credit for it, but I rejoice in the progress of what's being made for that. So we can say, God, we want to do this as a seat of honor to you to shift something in the culture and see people open to the gospel so that many can be swept into the kingdom. I'm not going to teach. Can you put up on the screen? Who's back there today? Uh, Mandy, put on the screen the four things about honor. All giving, I've taught you this many times. I don't have time to teach it right now, but all giving is about honor. Tithe honors God's position. He's the Lord of my life. Offerings honor God's person. It's an act of worship and adoration. Alms, that's giving to the needs of other people, honors God's passion because God's passion is people. Seed faith promise giving honors God's promises because he promises to return a harvest when we schedule it. But number three, alms, is sowing into God's passion because God's passion is people. How many know God loves people? And when we love people like God loves people, God likes that. I want him to like me. I know he loves me. I want him to like me. I want him to put his favor on me because I'm doing the things that he likes. So, Father, today, Lord, I've taught to the very best of my ability. Lord, it's been a wonderful day. Thank you for both of these services. Thank you for the opportunity to teach and to preach the living word of the Lord. And I pray that today, Lord, my family is receiving these teachings about duties and responsibilities of the kingdom. We're not just here for all the benefits. It's not just all about us. We're here to contribute. And I ask that today, Lord, you will help us do something tangible that will shift the spiritual climate of our county and see many people that are so close-minded to the church, they're so turned off, they're so anti-religion, they're so anti-church and anti-preacher that something might shift and they'll say, you know what? My heart is changing. It's softening. And I know that I probably need God in my life. I'm going to go to a place where I can find God to meet me because I know he'll be there when I go to meet him at that place. So Father, help us today to do something significant for the kingdom. We're going to receive an offering if you haven't got the gist of that yet and uh, our ushers are going to come and uh, we did this in the first service and we're going to do it in this service I have no idea how much was given in the first service I personally think it would be over the top phenomenal if family first could just wipe this thing out the rest of the twenty thousand dollars that would be so over the top phenomenal and if you're so a seat of honor today we're going to make sure, and I told Bob in the first service, make sure we do the same in this service. Don't get this mixed up with any of the other offerings. We'll just keep this all totally separate. But if you do want to make out a check, you can make it to Family First, and we'll deposit it and then turn around and rewrite a check. If you don't sew online, familyfirstassembly.com or on the text to give or in your on your uh, phone app or whatever. If there's not a place there to put your designation, if you're not so sure that we're aware of what you want to do, send us an email. 
Secretary at FamilyFirstAssembly.com. That's the best email right to the administration desk. Secretary at FamilyFirstAssembly.com. We'll take your offering, tell us what to do with it, and we'll put it into this seed towards medical debt reduction in Hernando County. And here's what I would recommend. I don't want you to raise your hands. But I know a lot of us are in debt as families. And I already made up my mind, the Holy Spirit dropped this in my heart, the seed that I'm sowing, the seed that my wife and I are sowing, we're targeting it towards uh, debt reduction in our lives. God told me in 2020 to get out of debt. I'm doing whatever I can. I'm doing anything and everything I can to get out of debt in the year 2020. I think it's important for God's people to get out of debt. And here's what the Lord will give us the opportunity to do. Sow a seed. And I'm going to target my seed towards debt reduction. Because if what I have is not what I need, it's not, my, it's not my harvest, it is my seed. So I'm going to sow it towards the future miracle that I need that God is going to wipe out debt in my life. And I'm going to say, God, I'm going to sow it with an expectation that when the harvest comes back, it's going to be for me to receive what you want me to have. Are you with me? So let's receive this today. And uh, please, I don't want you to feel any pressure. This is not about me. It's not about us. It's honestly about you. But it's also about people that we love. Lord, it's an honor here at Family First to be able to participate in this kingdom call in our city, to work together, to partner together with other churches, people of like precious faith, to shift the spiritual climate over our city. And I pray that that's exactly what happens, Lord, that something shifts in the heavenlies, that closed-mindedness will open, that hard-heartedness will soften, and there will be opportunities for many, hundreds, thousands of people to be swept into the kingdom of righteousness, peace, and joy by the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go right ahead, ushers. Receive any contributions, any gifts, any seed that the people would like to sow. And uh, as they come on past your row, why don't you go ahead and stand? As they kind of pass by you, go ahead and stand. And I'm not sure, Pastor Meredith, if you've got a, a song in your heart. I know you always have a, a song in your heart. This girl used to sing herself to sleep as a little tiny girl. She always has a song in her heart. So let's just sing to the Lord for a moment before we go. Amazing grace, how sweet the Thank you, Father, for the privilege of being part of the kingdom. Not only receiving all the benefits and all the blessings of citizenship, but taking up our obligations and our duties to honor the heart of the king, to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and to submit to the authority of the king of the kingdom so that we can see your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We give you honor. 
In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Put your hands together. Give the Lord some praise today. Amen. We'd love to meet you. Love to visit with you in the Global Brew Cafe. We got about those treats that she talked about, the Herbert Sherbert and some of those things. So if you're not in a hurry today, stick around for a few minutes. God bless you as you go in the grace of the Lord.